Hello and welcome to Dialogue. 2022 was a harsh year with the continuing pandemic, the Ukraine war, energy and food shortages around the world, and inflation in many countries. However, after China's recent change in COVID policy, more positive data has emerged in recent weeks, giving reasons to be optimistic about the global economy in 2023. What are the prospects for economic recovery this year? What are the macroeconomic challenges for policymakers? And what are the geopolitical obstacles standing in the way of global growth? To find out, I'm joined today by Nobel laureate Michael Spence, Philip H. Knight Professor and Dean Emeritus at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingduo. Hello, Professor. Now that China has reopened its borders, you know, investor sentiment uh, uh, in China is on a major upswing. Uh, at the same time, we do see there is a concern that you know, China's reopening may stir the global economy uh, in a sense of uh, uh, growing probably or elevated uh, energy prices. Uh, how do you foresee China's reopening this year and its influence or impact on the global economy? Well, overall, uh, China's, uh, you know, kind of opening up or the remainder of the opening up of the, of the economy is just is good for China, but it's good for the global economy. It's true. There might be some increased demand pressure, you know, in the energy and uh, commodity areas because China's a, a huge economy and a major consumer. But but I think, you know, the other effects, which are all positive, you know, the, the uh, increased contact, you know, better dialogue, uh, you know, more output, more growth in China. I think, you know, the next six months are going to be a little bit difficult. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but after that, I think, you know, we'll, with the second half of uh, this year, we'll start to look pretty good in terms of global growth. You said, uh, I quote here, uh, we are entering an era of geopolitical tensions and uh, fragmentation. Uh, so World Economic Forum founder uh, Klaus Schwab called for reinforced cooperation to address the <coughs> erosion of trust. Again, politics here. Uh, first, uh, what would you describe as the core factors of this uh, fragmentation, for example? Well, it really has two parts. You know, what we, you know for most of the last 30 or 40 years, um, we've had a, you know, a a, a really wonderful run in the global economy. China grew, other emerging economies grew. Um, you know, this created deflationary pressures. We didn't really have to worry too much about inflation um, and all that sort of thing. Um, now we have a what I call a shock prone world. These shocks are coming from all over the place, from increased severity and frequency of climate shocks. Um, you know, we had the war the in, in the Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, big energy transitions to deal with, you know, if we're going to, you know, effectively uh, manage the sustainability agenda. And we have the geopolitical tensions. Um, some of these overlap with each other, but the result of that is two things. Um, one of them is, you know, the agenda, the construction of kind of global trade and supply chains, which used to be based entirely on efficiency and comparative advantage grounds is going, is, is going to experience a pattern of diversification. Um, and diversification may be the right thing to do in a shock prone environment. You know, companies and countries are going to start moving in this direction, but it's expensive, right? Um, and so, so we're going to see a, a different architecture, um, you know, of global supply chains, and it's going to, it, it won't help um, with the supply, the supply constrained condition that we're in now. And then when you overlay the geopolitical tensions, I mean, the United States and China um, are in some kind of strategic competition. My personal view is that th that doesn't have to be particularly destructive, um, but there are destructive forms of it when, you know, when either side tries to hold the other one back uh, by denying access either to technology or to critical goods and so on. And, and so if we go down that road, um, then we're going to create an environment in which we do actually have a much more complicated and inefficient uh, global, e global economy. A and, you know, if you look at it from the point of view of multinational com companies, um, if we don't cooperate on sort of things like standards and handling data and a whole range of things, 
um, then they're going to find themselves operating in jurisdictions with with inconsistent and even conflicting rules. Um, so that's the kind of fragmentation that I think, you know, we we possibly could face. And it's one of the reasons why I think, you know, Klaus Schwab and many, many others are emphasizing the importance of of uh, reestablishing dialogue with the purpose of, of of finding ways to cooperate and avoiding to the extent possible um, this kind of uh, destructive nationalistic, uh, you know, competitive approach to international uh, interdependence. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Professor, of course, you know, we are uh, seeing, you know, China, U.S., you know, people are looking at their relationship. Uh, the two presidents met each other uh, not long ago, and of course, uh, Secretary of State Blinken uh, is set uh, to visit China in early February. Uh, so they're trying to manage that relationship. Uh, but then, of course, we don't know how far they can go. I mean, if left unchecked, uh, you know, how, what's the worst scenario? Are we going to see bifurcation of technology and also the economies? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I, sometimes deglobalization is sort of overemphasized. I mean, we, we, you know, it really isn't possible, <laughs> right? I mean, or to put it differently, the costs of, you know, full deglobalization are so high um, that I don't think anybody reasonably would expect us to go down that road. But, uh, but I think the meetings you mentioned are really quite encouraging. First, we have the pandemic opening up. So people are um, at very senior levels are meeting with each other. I think once they start meeting and, and, and seriously discussing um, what's the right balance between sort of tensions and competition on the one hand and cooperation in crucial areas like climate change on the other, they'll, they'll, they really will make some progress. You know, there's some downside risk. Um, there's, no le there's no question that, you know, the level of trust uh, between major entities like China and the United States has declined in the last little while. So rebuilding trust, trust doesn't, doesn't occur overnight, but, but it can be done, you know, with a step-by-step -step approach, you know, where you go for the things that really matter um, and then kind of build on that over time. I, I'm cautiously, I'm cautiously optimistic. You know, the, the, the senior people are meeting, the business people are going to start meeting again, the, you know, the financial folks um, are going to start getting together. And, and, and I think there's a, at least preliminary signs of a directional change in, uh, in the way in which we interact with each other. Well, let's hope for the best. Uh, and of course, for global economy, there are also uh, other factors. You, you mentioned in the recent interview uh, that many people in the financial industry have never experienced inflation in their lifetime. Uh, tell us more about that. Uh, you know, how does that kind of attitudes may affect the economic performance or their decision making? Well, I think in this area, there's a major change. I mean, we, as I said before, we, we've lived in a, in a period of essentially def deflationary forces that are in large part a result of the successful growth of China and a, and a wide range of emerging economies. This has just brought huge amounts of productive capacity to the global economy that wasn't there before, um, which meant that, you know, whenever we had a sort of an increase in demand, we had a surge in supply, but you know that 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 can't go on forever. There isn't an infinite supply of uh, unused productive capacity in the global economy, and when you add to that, you know, uh, aging. I mean, all of the developed world is aging. China is aging now. Japan is aging. Uh, you've got over seventy-five percent of the global economy that's experiencing reduced productive capacity. You've got the cost increases associated with the diversification that I referred to before. This is a very, very different world. Uh, this is a world where, you know, central banks cannot pump liquidity into the system and expect to get away with it without significant inflationary pressures. And so what I was saying in that brief comment is that, you know, in the financial system, even in policy making circles and certainly in business, you've got a whole younger generation of people who never lived in a world that had this kind of supply constrained, inflationary prone um, environment. And you need a different mindset to operate in that environment. You even, you even need different, you know, sort of accounting systems. I mean, I have friends who say, 
you know, have companies that have been built in the last 25 years who say their accounting systems aren't set up to handle inflationary pressures and what happens to inventories and so on, you know, in, uh, in an inflationary environment. So it's a big adjustment. I think we'll make it, but uh, we'll probably, there'll be some missteps along the way as people sort of learn that we're living in a, in a really, you know, architecturally very different world with respect to the relationship between supply and demand. Mm. And, you know, for example, we, you know, not only have we used a lot of the unused productive capacity, but we have, as you well know, in China, hundreds of millions of new middle class consumers. So the demand side of the global economy has exploded and that's all good, but it's a different world. Uh, well, the IMF has warned that uh, you know, a third of the global economy is likely to fall into recession in this year. Uh, do you believe that? You know, what are the resulting global economic ripple effects if such a prediction turns out to be true? Yeah, so I, I think it's quite possible that they're right about this and they're very knowledgeable and they have their fingers on the pulse of um, what's going on in a wide range of countries. But, you know, so I mean, the, the problem really is the, the shocks that we were referred to before. So we had the pandemic shock. Um, many of these countries did not get vaccines till very late in the game. Um, their fiscal situations deteriorated very quickly, um, you know, because of the need to try to live through the pandemic. Um, trade fell off. Uh, then you have the war in Ukraine. Rising energy and food prices are producing distress and even famine in a number of these countries. You have the climate shocks coming at them. And now with the um, tightening monetary policy, you have uh, a, a growing signs of uh, financial and fiscal distress in these countries. And, and most people, knowledgeable people say, there's gonna probably have to be a fair amount of debt restructuring in these economies. So if I had to summarize that, I would say a subset of the global economy is facing something that looks like a perfect storm. Um, and it's very difficult to see how, you know, without a massive amount of help, and even then, um, you could avoid a kind of recessionary um, thing. So I think that's an important part of what the, the global economy is saying, and and trying to mitigate all of the, the combined effect of all of that on these countries should be part of the international agenda. I hope it is, but um, but but I think there's a real possibility. I mean, there there is no question. Mm -hmm. um, that these countries are in for a very, very difficult, uh, you know, near-term future. Well, if there's anything we can do to reverse that trend, or you seem quite uh, pessimistic about the 2023. I have, well, I am in part because uh, the inflation fight is not going to stop. We're not going to take away the, you know, the rising value of the major currencies like the dollar. Um, I don't, you know, that's just plain producing um, financial distress in a lot of places, you know, especially places that have, you know, dollar or hard currency denominated debt. I mean, you know, it just gets bigger, you know, if their currencies devalue and, uh, you know, but again, if financial institutions with big balance sheets um, or bigger balance sheets than they have could do a fair amount to kind of mitigate this shock. Um, and there's a, a, a kind of global discussion of doing a better job of, um, of debt restructuring than we have. The problem in that area is you have not only have the public sector folks involved and the central banks, but you've got a whole bunch of private sector investors. You've got a transparency problem. A lot of the times you don't even know who these investors really are and so on. So it, it's, uh, to use a technical term, a bit of a mess. Um, but, and so it's difficult to deal with, but it, but it's worth the effort that's going into it to try to make these processes smoother and more beneficial to the, to the countries involved. Uh, we know the U.S. largest economy rolled out a, a series of acts last year, including, you know, Chips and Science Act and also the Inflation Reduction Act. And, uh, in the U.S., you know, the government see it as uh, steps towards uh, uh, building up the U.S. economy, uh, in particular the manufacturing uh, sector. Uh, but of course, we do see criticism, you know, uh, including from European countries uh, 
uh, seeing that as a part of the protectionism. How do you see the moves by the U.S. government? Well, yeah, so this is actually a fairly complicated area. So the 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 Chips um, and Science Act is a uh, is has two parts. One is elevated investment in science and technology, um, and and by and large that you know is a good thing. It has another part, um, which has to do with you know who's going to participate in this and who we're going to ship goods or share technology with, and that's the part that's more problematic, right? So the Chips and Science Act has both of those components in it. Um, you know, the 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 part that worries people is the part where we seem to be denying access to the most um, advanced, dense um, semiconductor chips um, to China or the equipment you need to make them. And 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 what lies behind that, I think, is that these are these are the semiconductors that are required for the most advanced forms of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so it's really what's driving this isn't just semiconductors, it's artificial intelligence and machine learning and the potential to use these um, these technologies, not just in the economy, but in the national security area. So one of the problems that we have, and it's a real problem that needs uh, leadership on all sides, is, uh, is you know, this overlap uh, or the incursion of the national security agenda into you know, an otherwise um, more benign economic agenda. And the, and the trick is, I think there is the challenge is to prevent the national security agenda from becoming, uh, you know, overwhelmingly dominant and actually interfering um, with the performance of the of individual economies and the global economy. The, the Inflation Reduction Act is a little bit different. Uh, you know, it's it has a the name is completely misleading. <laughs> <laughs> not the about inflation. inflation. <laughs> it's not about inflation. It's about um, climate change and sustainability, mainly. Um, and the problem is, in the United States and maybe in other places, we have not been able um, to put taxes or prices on carbon in a way to create the appropriate incentives. Um, and because we couldn't do that, but we didn't, but the Biden administration didn't want to sit on the sidelines, um, we did it with subsidies as well. So the subsidies aren't meant to be protectionist, mainly. They're made to, meant to advance the, um, the sustainability agenda or the American contribution to it. The problem with that is that it then creates competitive problems for all of our trading partners, whether they're in Europe or China or other parts of Asia or Latin America. And so, so the, the trigger for this is the inability to use um, taxes or something that's the equivalent of it, carbon pricing, um, to create the appropriate incentives. Now, you know, in truth, we always have a mix, but the, the, the American approach so far is heavily dependent on, um, on the subsidization side, and it is creating frictions. Um, it will be, I think, you know, brought to the WTO. Um, the you, Europeans who've, in some sense, led the charge on uh, climate change uh, policy are um, complaining about it and so on. So we have to find a better balance. Uh, um, I think, you know, the alternative, which would be uh, the United States drop out of the climate change agenda would not be the ideal alternative for sure, um, because we all have to participate in this to have even a remote chance of success. Um, but, but, it, but the American approach is causing these problems. Uh, well, you mentioned about the climate change. Uh, uh, in an article you wrote on climate action, uh, you questioned you know, whether it is better, uh, if it is better to cling to an unattainable target or revise that goal uh, to something more feasible. I think the UN uh, climate agency also basically uh, agree with you. Uh, they say it is uh, almost you know, no credible pathway to 1.5 degrees Celsius in place. Uh, tell us more in that respect. You know what kind of uh, new target we should have, uh, probably. Well, you know, so the challenge. Nobody wants to do anything that you know demotivates people and says, "Well, we failed, so let's give up." Right? <laughs> we ought to do two things. We ought to be a little bit more transparent about you know what the art of the possible is, and the second thing is if we're going to miss 
1.5 degrees, then we ought to have a significant fraction of the agenda focused on how we're going to adapt to the climate change that kind of really does come at us. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you think we need to do, you know, on the public level, for example, uh, is there a lack of uh, the awareness of the urgency to fight climate change or on the government's level, the lack of action, maybe? Yeah, I think, you know, 15 years ago, you and I would probably would have agreed there was an awareness problem. I don't, I don't think there's an awareness problem anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's you, you have to be I mean, there's, you know, climate deniers, but that's different than kind of awareness. Uh, and so so I don't think that is the problem. The problem is it's very complicated. You know, it's a multidimensional agenda, much of which is international. Um, there's a distributional part, you know, who should shoulder what fraction of the burden. And that's very, very difficult. We see that in all the climate, me all these COP, you know, the sequence of COP meetings. Um, and so and, and, and the, I guess I'd mention one other factor, you know, making this energy transition, which is what we're really talking about, energy efficiency and the greening of the energy mix um, involves very large amounts of investment, you know. They're not impossible to imagine. The estimates are $3.5 trillion a year. The global economy is 80 or $90 trillion. So that's not, you know, nobody would say that's a ridiculously outrageous, impossible achievement, but it's a big increment. And we're, we're living in a world, um, at least many of us are, of um, high sovereign debt ratios and rising interest rates. Uh, and I, I personally do not expect the real interest rates to fall back to where they were in the old days for the reasons we talked about before, the difference in the supply conditions in the global economy. That means it's going to be more expensive um, in, you know, in declining fiscal spaces to, to generate the public sector part of that $3.5 trillion or whatever the right number is um, investment. So I think there are major challenges. Uh, it's a bottom line coming from multiple dimensions. Um, it's not an awareness problem. It's, you know, how do we get it done? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, of course, you know, for a lot of challenges around the world, it requires the cooperation uh, you know, between Beijing and Washington, the two largest economies uh, in terms of emissions, you know, fight to fight the climate change or for the stability of the world or global economy, for example. Uh, but then again, right. many people are talking about the competition, for example, in uh, area beyond their national borders, for example, in the Middle East or Africa. Uh, you know, China has a strong relationship with Africa. It has been uh, growing for, uh, for, for you know, years, Absolutely. if not decades. Um, but of course, you know, from the Washington's point of view, uh, that's, you know, about you know, whether winning or losing in terms of their influence in the African continent or in the Middle East. Uh, is there any way can they, you know, work together probably uh, instead of, uh, say, you know, competing for influence? The influence is kind of like invisible. <laughs> you know, what is the influence, for example, in Africa or in the Arab world? Uh, is there any way they will work together, uh, overcome this kind of uh, probably, I'm not sure, like whether that's uh, the right perception or whatever issues there? You know, we, I mean, we had a we had a form of this back in the Cold War, um, where the basically attention was being paid to developing countries, and it was a larger set at that time. Um, we didn't have a lot of middle income countries that were, you know, had been growing at seven percent in the Cold War, um, and you know, there was a lot of you know, kind of investing in uh, in countries, you know with minimal attention to, you know, what it was really doing in the economy and whether you were supporting the right kind of uh, governance structures and so on. It, it was really about influence or keeping, you know, those economies from being part of the other side. I think we can avoid that on this round. I don't think either the United States or Europe or, or China is investing in these countries, you know, for purely selfish reasons. Uh, China is a big investor, the biggest investor um, in uh, in Africa at this point. Um, and I think it, you know, wants to be influential because it wants to be a beneficial, you know, partner um, in the development of the 
the continent that is the least developed at this point. Um, and I'm hoping that the uh, renewed American attention to this, while it may have a component, you know, that is designed to sort of counter China's very significant influence uh, there. Um, but I would hope it would have the same motivation. So once again, I mean, I think a solution to this is one, to agree on the objectives and the first order objective ought to be sort of growth development and progress in these uh, less developed areas. And we should agree on that and then find a way to invest in it that's, that looks more cooperative and less like, you know, competing for attention. And we certainly shouldn't go down the road of asking countries to choose. I mean, one of the most striking things in November, we had four major meetings, right? We had the G20, the ASEAN, the APEC <laughs> summit, and the COP28. Uh, and and in all of them, the voices of the you know emerging economies were loud and clear. They just said, we don't want to go down a road that's dominated by you know pretty selfish geopolitical competition. And I think those voices were heard. Um, the other thing we need to do to pr promote the cooperative agenda is to strengthen, I feel strongly about this, the international institutions and increase their balance sheet. So they also are major investors, major, major investors. I'm talking about the regional development banks, the World Bank, the IMF, et cetera. Um, these need to be important players um, in helping these countries not only grow, but make the sustainability agenda transition. And I don't see any reason why we can't agree on that. The, you know, the governance structures of these institutions are legacies of the days when the developed economies dominated the global economy, then they do not reflect the increasing power and influence of China, India, and other emerging economies. So I think if we're gonna succeed on that, um, one of many items on the international agenda is to fix the government governance structure so it's a reflection of uh, the sort of real economic conditions and economic power in the global economy. If we do all those things, then I think we could have a beneficial form of, you know, call it friendly competition um, as we invest in these countries. And to be honest with you, if this goes well, these these are good investments. I mean, if China moves into high growth mode, I'm sorry, if, if a number of African countries move into high growth mode, leveraging digital technologies and other things, um, you know, companies coming from China and the United States and Europe and all over the place are going to find them, you know, very attractive places to invest. I, you probably have encountered this with your other guests, but there's a global explosion of entrepreneurial activity in the world. It's just literally everywhere. I mean, we used to be able to count on the fingers of a couple of hands, you know, the hotspots, the ecosystems that generated technology based entrepreneurial activity just isn't true anymore. You know, this United States, Northern Europe, China, India, Africa to some extent, certainly Latin America. You can find a growing number of unicorns on all of these places. So I think that policy should be focused on creating an environment in which these creative, innovative forces get to work uh, and function effectively everywhere in the world. Hopefully we can get a win-win-win for everybody. Uh, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to Michael Spence, the Nobel Laureate, for joining us. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qingduo. Thank you for being with us. See you next time.